that you'd nailed the, the art of caring for these children, and then you'd lose two children in an hour. You know, I remember one day losing two children in an hour, both of whom I was dealing with there and then. You know, I remember trying to sort of cannulate this little, this little baby, and, you know, and knowing the end was imminent, you know, and, and right in front of you. Hello and welcome to the World Extreme Medicine Podcast. I'm Dr. Marcus Stevens, and today we are joined by Dr. Matthew Jones. Welcome to the podcast, Matthew. Hi there, Marcus. Nice to see you again. So Matthew's enjoyed an incredibly diverse career, first studying history at Cambridge before training as a corporate lawyer in London. After realising this wasn't quite for him, he went to medical school in Newcastle, and then since then he spent the majority of his time working abroad, including periods in Nepal, Burkina Faso, Mali, South Sudan, and most recently Ukraine, where he was training emergency response teams with World Extreme Medicine. He's also a pretty phenomenal runner, having run several marathons sub two and a half hours, completed the infamous Marathon de Saab, and over a thousand kilometer Camino de Santiago in three weeks. Today, we're going to be talking about Matthew's time in South Sudan, where he spent 10 months, 10 months running a pediatric ward. Matthew, would you like to tell us a little bit about what you were doing before this and how you came to take up this incredible opportunity? Yeah, so um, in, in sort of very brief outline, I trained, uh, I, I finished medical school in 2014 and then did the, the two-year foundation program in uh, Middlesbrough and an extra year as a teaching fellow. And then I sort of stumbled into the opportunity um, to go to South Sudan with an American charity uh, called the Catholic Medical Mission Board. So it really was just by chance that um, I, I remember reading an article in The Guardian about one of their very sort of famous humanitarian doctors called Dr. Tom Katina, who uh, had spent eight years uh, in Nubia, uh, part of south of Sudan and they were looking for a doctor to go to various locations including South Sudan so yeah and and uh, I remember sort of having this interview with them and they said to me we've got numerous postings we've got uh, uh, you know and they listed a few postings and I'm sure they're, they're, they're difficult postings but they clearly weren't necessarily the the really sort of the the edge on the edge and then they said and then we've got South Sudan and uh, for some reason, sort of uh, in a moment of madness, I sort of offered just to, uh, to go wherever they needed. And so, uh, yeah, and that's how I ended up in South Sudan. Goodness, what a, what a start. And do you want to tell us a little bit about South Sudan and uh, yeah, maybe a, a little touch on its history and, and what makes it quite such an attractive place to work for, for someone like yourself who's looking for that job uh, on, on the edge? Yeah, so South Sudan has, uh, it's, I think it's still the youngest nation. Um, uh, it was officially admitted to the United Nations in 2011 after, I think it was 29, a 29 year sort of secessionist uh, sort of breakaway conflict with uh, Sudan. Um, so eventually the peace deal was recognized in 2011. And, um, it may it might, may have got the date slightly wrong on that, and I think, but within a very sort of brief, short period, this the new country with all its newfound hopes sort of went up in smoke as uh, the two main warring tribes um, sort of immediately fell out, and the country descended into a sort of dark and unpleasant uh, civil war. So that was what was uh, the sort of the, the brief sort of background. Um, that's what, in theory, must have appealed to me on some level. Um, so when I went there, this was in 2018, it was, uh, I, it may have been between two periods of conflict. There may have been a sort of a fragile peace or a truce in, in place when I landed. Um, and I did very little whilst I was there to, uh, to, to damage the, the peace or the truce. I managed to avoid uh, wading in. Um, and yeah, so I then sort of spent nine, ten months um, in, in basically one geographical area. And probably one of the most sort of psychologically distinctive features of it was it was simply the fact that for the sort of 10 months of my life, I was literally existed within a geographical region of about two or three miles. Um, I mean, I didn't sort of once leave that two or three mile uh, radius um, uh, sort of, you know, enclosure. 
Um, and, and that was my life for 10 months, running a paediatric ward there. Gosh, and what were your you know, first impressions on arriving by, I mean, how did you get there? Did you, did you, I assume there must have been a, a fair bit of flying. Did, did you have to drive in? Yeah, what were your, your first impressions? Kind of where were you living and, and what was the, the ward, the clinic like? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of, it, it's sort of going to the remote, a, a remote edge and then going from that remote edge to the remote edge of that remote edge. Um, I mean, it's a remarkably sort of, you know, that you fly into the main, the capital. I mean, the capital is, it, it really is the Wild West. I mean, it's, 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 it's a wild place with roaming gangs. And I mean, a day after I arrived, the, the charity, the two main officials there were held up at gunpoint, uh, leaving the bank with a large number of dollars. Um, I mean, not so much held up as just relieved of cash. It was a sort of, sounded like a reasonably straightforward, stress-free encounter. Um, and so, you know, that was, that, and that was the end of my experience of tarmac for the next 10 months, being in the capitals. You then catch another plane over to the west of the country. Um, and then you really are into the stereotypical sort of dirt runways, an old man chasing his goat, herd of goats off the runway before the plane lands type uh, scenario. Um, and even then, you know, you're, you've still sort of two hours drive, so you're pretty remote there. And then you've got a sort of a two, two hour drive on, um, you know, 20 kilometer dirt track road. And then, yeah. And, and, and when, you know, I remember arriving in the hospital and I mean, it's sort of, it's quite sort of, I, I think until that point, when, when you're sort of arriving and you're still in that, you're still in the NGO world of four by fours and, reasonably com a reasonably comfortable NGO like existence and then is, is that sensation of being you know I'm about to be dropped off now and in a way the NGO comforts are about to come to the end and I'm just going to be you know a rural sort of mission doctor um it's a bit like sort of so sort of I've been taken to a party as a young kid by your parents and all of a sudden it dawns on you that <laughs> at some point you know you're not going to be the new person being introduced. They're just going to leave you and, and, and there you'll be. Um, and yeah, and yeah, I've still got some of the video footage of the arriving in the, in the four by four. And it really is the end of the, it really is the end of the line there. You know, there's, there's, there's nothing beyond this place, but jungle and, uh, and thicket for, for, for thousands of miles. I mean, you could probably walk in jungle from where I was all the way to the Atlantic coast through Congo. <laughs> Well, I never thought I'd hear South Sudan described as like arriving at a party, but I, uh, I, 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 I see what you mean. Goodness me, dropped off, yeah. turned around. Your your parents have, are very much in the car and gone. And yes. What were your population? What was the population you were looking after? I mean, what was your your kind of catchment area? Um, it must have been enormous. Mm. Yeah, I mean, they described the catchment population for this hospital as being 260,000 or something. I mean, it's, you know, the, the, the town I was in was sort of, was, it was 90,000. But in a way, it's quite deceptive even thinking and talking about towns because it's an incredibly sparsely populated area. It's not, an, uh, it's not urban. It's just a very sort of concentrated, very concentrated or a very large dispersed village, it feels like. You know, I mean, there are 90,000 people in, in, in this town, but, you know, there are no, se there are no second floor buildings. There's no tarmac. It's just nothing but a sort of set of sort of village like enclosures and mud huts just stretching in all directions, you know, sort of dotted through the, through the jungle and the, 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 the scrubland. Um, and yeah, but the wider population then, I mean, we had people coming from across the border from Central African Republic to the hospital, from the Democratic Republic of Congo to the hospital, um, you know, and, and, you know, I mean, the, the border is a sort of a bit of not an irrelevance. It's obviously very real in some senses, but I was working, it was something, the, the, the ethnic territory was the, was Zandiland, the Zandi people, you know, the third, third largest tribe in South Sudan, obviously just, you know, stretches across the, into the, the, the neighboring two countries. So 
a classic example of the sort of the colonial division. So you had the, the Belgian uh, Democratic Republic, and the French Central African Republic, and the British South Sudan, but they'd all taken a chunk of Zandiland. Um, yeah, you know, and, and yeah, so you used to routinely see patients from Congo and Central African Republic. A very diverse uh, population then. And and who were you joining to arrived at this? You've painted a, a you know, brilliant picture of, of kind of arriving and, and you know, what you were surrounded by. Who was running the hospital? Who were you joining? Who were your colleagues when you when you got to work? Mm. With them? Well, I think in a way the most the most distinctive and difficult element of the entire experience was dealing with the the people running the hospital. So, I mean, you had you know you had local staff who tended to fulfil the nursing roles and the the more basic sort of care roles. Uh, you had. A, a small number of trained clinicians, most of whom were Ugandan, um, so clinical officers and another doctor. Uh, but then the administrators of the hospital, I, it sounds a more complicated concept than it really was. It was simply two Italian, no, one Italian nun and one Ugandan nun, so Sister Laura and Sister Jen. Um, and they were, they were, very, very interesting to deal with. They'd spent 30, 32 years working out in Africa um, for the Comboni, the Comboni sisters, so an Italian order of nuns. Um, I mean, Sister Laura in particular was a very difficult, complicated, um, uh, tough character to deal with. Um, you know, and, and it, was a, it was a very sort of strange and defining at times, the very difficult aspect of the whole experience was being part of the hierarchy and needing to support the hierarchy, which one does in a hospital, but being conscious that you were dealing with people who had a very sort of brutal, slightly colonial, well, very colonial uh, attitude towards, towards you know, the, the local people. You know, I mean, there were plenty of th ways in which these two nuns behaved and, and things they said, which, you know, out of the mouth of a, of, a, of a Westerner would sound just simply, a normal Westerner would sound completely sort of racist and colonial. And their attitudes were, were very old school. But you had to work with that and you had to deal with that. And there was, I mean, if I hadn't been able to, been prepared to work with that, it would have literally lasted a week. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it was a very complicated sort of cultural exchange in that sense. Interesting. I mean, always fascinating to meet the the, the real diverse range of characters who, who want to pursue this work, isn't it? And uh, yeah, mm. goodness, a collection of nuns working for 30 years in Africa. They must have, yeah. must have seen some things. And Yeah, and... Uh... Yeah, I mean, the, the, the stereotypical image of a nun cycling to hospital on a Sunday morning was, was completely the case there. Well, you really are painting quite a picture. Um, so what was your, aside from of, you know, working along alongside these these nuns, what was your normal day like? What, what was the, the ward like? What was the, the medical work like? What were you, what were you doing? So I was predominantly running the children's ward. So, um, I mean, which involved basically doing a, a ward round in the morning. So, you know, you'd start at about eight o'clock. Uh, and then, I mean, because of the seasonal nature of malaria, uh, the number of patients I would see in the morning would sort of vary between about 15 in malaria low season up to about 70 in malaria high season. So, I mean, at its sort of busiest, you would be doing a ward round, more or less without stopping over about three or four hours, seeing about 70 children, most of whom had malaria. Um, you know, this was in a, basically a glorified tin shed at, in about 30 degree heat. Um, so I would sort of go round with the local staff and, uh, and just one by one work my way through this, uh, this sort of, this cohort of sick malaria stricken children um, and that would take you anywhere through to the middle of the afternoon and then be lucky then you could sort of escape have some lunch charge up your batteries and then come in for the afternoon to 
follow up on the cases, check the sicker patients, and then new admissions. Um, and so, you know, by about seven o'clock, you know, when your day would come to an end, you'll have spent about 11 hours with about sort of nine hours at times of clinical contact, dealing with the, uh, the you know, with mostly very sick children. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, and, and this, this was seven days a week, and I had seven days off in 10 months, in about well, nine and a half months. So, I mean, I once did the calculation, I probably did meet and treat around, I think it was about three and a half thousand children in that time. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was intense and exhausting and unrelenting. Um, and I won't lie that I was counting down the days to leaving with about five months to go. It was just a, as a psychological coping strategy. The only way I could do it was literally to count down the days. So I'd be at 150 to go. And it didn't mean that I was having a terrible time or an awful time, but it's, it's a psychological pressure, that sort of monotony. And, and, of course, allied to the fact that, you know, you are dealing with very sick kids and you're losing, you know, roughly two to three children a week are dying under your care. Um, so, yeah, a lot, a lot of psychological pressure. It sounds very, very intense, as, as you say, and I think that is quite a striking thing to hear of, of losing children at, at that frequency. And I suppose any of us, many, many of, of the listeners will will have worked in in perhaps similar places, or or very much be aware of of you know global health, the global health world, and and really what the reality is for for lots of people. But I suppose most of us who've worked predominantly in in the UK or, or elsewhere may not have come across children dying even during you know quite extended pediatric rotations what was that like I mean how did you deal with that on a personal professional level um mm -hmm. that must have been really hard yeah it's it, it it is it is it is really hard and I don't think you you get numb, but you don't get accustomed to it. You, you know, you, you know, you, you, you at no stage did I find myself getting flippant or, or finding a sort of a, a dark humor in it or anything like that. No coping strategy seemed to really sort of help in any situation. It was always a kind of numbing, gut wrenching feeling. And, you know, and, and, and of course, it, it, these weren't neutral events that were going on. They were, there were often events where you would look at it and think, what, did I make a mistake? You know, what could I have done differently? Should I have done di things differently? Inevitably, you know, I, I think 45 children died on the ward that year. I mean, incidentally, you know, that was statistically much a much improved rate than the previous years. So were, we did have statistics going back. So it wasn't, there wasn't a sort of a, a peak of, of child deaths whilst I, when I arrived or anything sort of alarming. But, um, but no, I mean, and, and, you know, you, you, you have cases where, you know, you, you go away for the evening and you leave a child there who's arrived and you admit and you do everything you think you can do, you know, and, and, and I, and I think that the, the strange thing was, it, it was sort of coming in the next morning and, and that slight sense that it was, you weren't sure if it was affecting you, you more than other people, you know, for, you know, you didn't you had this worry that it was a sort of a, just a routine humdrum event for for the, for the locals and 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 you just felt this terrible sense inside of 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 what could i have done differently and could i have done more you know and you know and and it was a sort of helplessness i think is a good way to put it yeah helpless in the face of these events um you know and and you know and and you you know i mean and, and occasionally it just felt like you were being kicked and kicked and kicked. I remember, you know, you'd go through a week where no child would die and you'd think you'd really ma mastered it. You'd nailed the, the art of caring for these children. And then you'd lose two children in an hour. You know, I remember one day losing two children an hour, both of whom I was dealing with there and then. You know, I remember trying to sort of cannulate this little, this little baby and, you know, and knowing the end was imminent you know, and, and right in front of you. And, it, you know, I mean, it's a sort of, it's a, it's a strange, 
sort of it's strange sort of even now i mean i can just feel the emotional response just thinking about it that sort of sense of you know i don't know you you know death is something that you sort of have as a concept in your head and then just to see it completely in front of you in your face and and not really have any words to describe or manage your own feeling to that i mean it is it is it, it was extremely sort of emotionally uh challenging provoking num num numifying if that's not that's not quite the word but um but very you know and you know and and without the ability to really to prob probably really talk about it with other people so you know you you know you couldn't you know we didn't have time to have i i tried to hold a little sort of mortality meetings with some of these cases and we did do it and we discussed what could have been done differently but there's no real sort of way to process that emotionally in the moment and then events keep happening so yeah a very sort of um characteristic um sort of very sort of um stark stark emotional experience at times goodness thank you for for yeah that sounds incredibly challenging and thank you for for you know talking through what what must have been really really difficult events you know mm. can can really see how much it still still affects you and and you know mm. looking back can't, can't be easy um i mean you touched on there on, on on some of the things that you tried to to introduce and obviously we've we've worked together you know quite a lot in the past um you know mainly in west africa and i, and I know a lot of that work has been you you know improving yeah, you know, healthcare systems. You know, really getting to grips with with how a clinic and and a team works, and and really going deep on trying to improve that. Were you able to uh, to make changes where you felt like there was an improvement? Um, how was that over over the course of your your ten months? Yeah. So, well, I mean, you know, you 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 imagine all the aspects of kind of almost break it down into the aspects of of what is decent care and um you know a, a a reliable method for 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 gathering information and you almost had to design it from scratch i mean i used to joke quite a lot even at the time and later about our handover board so we used to have a, have a simple white board in the staff room the idea and i and i I tried to set up a system so that we'd record, if nothing else, not every patient, because there were too many, but at least the very sickest patients. And it used to become, become a sort of almost, I don't know, a strange Kafkaesque game in my head, because so often I, I, I draw the lines on the board. It's, it's a really strange description, this. I draw the lines on the board so you could record each individual patient. And, and I tried to explain to the staff why I was doing this. And why we'd use permanent marker for the lines and then we'd use temporary marker for the patient records and this went on for months it went on for months and nobody followed this system and they kept rubbing out the wrong lines or they'd write the patients in permanent markers or i'd come in the next morning and find a cleaner had literally wiped all of the information all the sickest patient had wiped it all off you know it was it was this sort of it was a form of like for a relatively neurotic, organised Western mind, it was it was a form of torture. So it's like, can we, I, you know, I used to sometimes, you know, I'd write. You can't make this up. I, I I would write the rules of the board at the bottom. You know, use permanent marker for lines, use temporary marker for patients, and that would get wiped off. You know, you're like this. I don't even know. I couldn't even sort of. It became a sort of an element of sort of high Kafkaesque farce, trying to get this system to preserve, um, and and eventually, you, and you and and that's the thing. It's, it's it's both an example and a metaphor for how difficult it is to bed in these basic habits which you take for granted, you know. And it's it's this it's trying to explain to them that you know ninety percent isn't good enough. You know, not, doing an, a drug round where you get ninety percent of the patients is not good enough, or ninety percent of the prescriptions are correct. You know, and it was, it was, it was, it was amazing. I mean, you know, I remember, I remember very early on having a diabetic patient, and you know, I prescribed the medication, and I, I, I'd written this medication down. I turned my back, and the nurse was so close to giving the medication, the insulin. 
and so close to giving 10 times the dose. I, I, I can't remember the exact, exactly how he got 10 times the dose, but he had. He either misread my handwriting or misunderstood it. And I, I was like, it was, it was the, the, those sort of th habits you take for granted where someone might check a drug or check a dose or, or you know, and, and, and it, was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was remarkable how attentive you had to be to those sort of basic things to prevent catastrophe after catastrophe happening. And, of course, sometimes you failed and, and, uh, and, and weren't able to. Um, I mean, I'll just get one more example on that. I remember we used to have, we used to have a, a mean, we used to have the, the film for diagnosing sickle cell disease. Um, no, the electrophoresis, that was it, serum electrophoresis. And it, it, it took me two months to understand how their system worked. And it was such a weird um, upside down system. It took me two months to understand why. I kept saying to them, can we do a serum electrophoresis on this child? Yes, yes, yes. And it wouldn't get done or it would take a week to get done. It took me two months to realize there was one tiny issue. And the issue was that um, they'd been told previously that they could only run five samples at a time. So what was happening was that I'd ask for one, and then they would literally just wait for the five to get filled up, however long it took, if that took like four or five days. And they wouldn't say to me, we can't do it today because you don't have five samples. And I remember then I said to them, one minute, so... If I really need it done, why don't we just put four samples from members of staff in? And they're like, okay. I was like, okay, so that's taken two months to fix this problem. So that's two months where I couldn't get results. And now we've we fixed this problem. But they didn't they also didn't necessarily have the confidence to turn around to me and say, This isn't why it's working, or they didn't have the experience to say there is a problem here. For them, it was just the system. The system was that you'd only put the, the, get the machine going with five tests. There was no way around that in their heads. And eventually we, we cracked the code and, you know, we then started getting results reliably and on time. You know, in sickle cell anemia, I mean, you need that diagnosis when you've got a kid in front of you who's very sick. But, um, yeah. So, yeah, lots of challenges. And a lot, a lot of the challenges were very dry challenges, like, you know, information gathering, information collection. You know, an awful lot of my time was spent not sort of dealing with great moral issues, but was actually dealing with how do I ensure that these notes are collected properly? How do I ensure that these observations are done on time? How do I store this data? You know, that sort of tedious sort of but necessary aspect. Yeah, I, I think a lot of uh, the experience of, of going to work in, in, in under-resourced places is, is taking lots of the things that, that we do naturally in, in the UK, for example, isn't it? And reminds me of uh, one of my one of my personal sort of achievements working working in Mali, having having set up a small clinic um, in southern Mali, was was trying to tackle that issue of feedback. And I remember after yeah, early on giving a teaching session to to the clinic staff, um, doctor, and a couple of nurses, and saying, you know, was that good? You know, what 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 would you like to what would you change or you know, what would you like to learn and sort of unanimous sort of, you know, round of applause almost and fantastic teaching session and, and, and sort of realizing that, you know, really that the concept of feedback as we know it of actually was that useful, give honest feedback wasn't there and trying desperately to instill that, you know, yes, technically I'm your boss, but yes, you can, you can talk back. And if you've got to worry, and I remember the day months, months mm. later where, I kind of said something I, I've forgotten now what it was. I, I asked them to do something or I suggested we do something or, and someone sort of tentatively put their hand up and said, um, I don't want to do that. or I'm not happy about that. And I kind of, this sort of, you know, joyful feeling inside me that we got through that and we were able to have from then on kind of very honest conversations about, about the clinic and, and how we work together. And um, it was really that, that stepping stone to, to a much, much better functioning clinic. And, um, I mean, I, I digress slightly, and I know since since South Sudan, you've um, done quite a lot of teaching, and when when we worked together at Critical Care International, uh, quite a lot of your your work was was around uh, making those improvements and actually teaching uh, within the clinic environment. If you went back to South Sudan now, having done all of that and, and experienced so much more. Anything you do differently in terms of tackling those professional challenges and, and trying to make improvements? 
Um, it's a very, that's a, that's a fantastic question. If I turned up again today, what would I do differently? I think, I mean, you'd eliminate, yeah. I mean, some of it is you'd eliminate your misconceptions and your, your naiveties. I mean, they, they, you know, you know, you, you, you go with your sort of your misconceptions and your naiveties and you look back in hindsight, slightly embarrassed at, you know, I, I spent too, I spent a little bit too long in the first month trying to get them to reduce the amount of antibiotics they were prescribing, you know, in a kind of sort of global health responsibility sort of sense. And then you realize after a while that, you know, you, you weren't calibrating correctly to the context. You were, you were slightly overlooking certain, you know, massive differences between the two healthcare systems. And, you know, and there you are sort of withholding antibiotics when you're treating a child in the dark who really could well have meningitis and those sorts of naiveties, um, I would definitely sort of challenge. Um, you know, I, I, I guess in a way, it, the problem is, is that you, you, you don't really sort of, you're so reactive on the ground, you know, you, you think, well, I, this time I'd go, I'd, I'd, I'd go and I'd have more information tools with me, you know, but, you know, you would struggle to bed them in, I know. You'd struggle to bed them in and, I mean, everything sort of, every, every system you introduced there broke immediately and then you had to re you'd have to fix it anyway. You know, you were so sort of reactive to weird individual circumstances, um, you know, and you were so sort of having to, to improvise constantly on the, on, on, the, on the hoof, you know, I mean, you know, improvise. I mean, literally found myself at times improvising pieces of a nebulizer, you know, because we couldn't find, we couldn't find the missing like attachment for the nebulizer. And you were sort of a woman in front of you were basically having a sort of life threatening asthma attack. And I'm there trying to rebuild their nebulizer, you know, that sort of, you know, and, and, and it, it, it's that level of sort of, of, of chaos where, you know, you're not really, it's not like the Swiss cheese model where there are one or two holes and occasionally things fall through. It's like, you know, it's just all air. It's just all air with, with, a, with an occasional sort of by chance obstacle preventing a complete disaster. But most of the time, basically everything that can go wrong does go wrong and goes wrong all the time. Um, you know, and uh, I, yeah, I think, um, I, th I think, I think, you know, I think I went... I, th I think when I look back, though, I think I did. I think I went with the right in the right spirit. I think I quickly appreciated that you know that the main challenge there is sort of is 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 it was building relations with the staff. It's building knowledge, skills, confidence. It was building relationships, though, more than anything. And I think, I think you know, you just have to build those relationships, work with what you've got, and. And you know, and 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 improvise, and 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 then and then just find constant fixes every day to every everyday problems. Yeah, I I guess looking back, there's there's yeah you know, a lot of things that 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 you might change, but also you know an awful lot that you would would do absolutely the same. And and like you say, you can't really plan for for these things, can you? Um. Mm. You mentioned there, kind of, you know, uh, looking after children in the dark and, and also nebulizer. You, could you give us a bit more of a picture of, of kind of what your ceiling of care was, you know, what you had at hand to, to treat these children? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you had you had very sort of, I mean, you had very sort of limited tools in, in the sense that, you know, I, I, I think I, I was always really averse and I would still be averse now to any heroic interventions as, as a sort of basic priority. I mean, there were times when you had very sick children who, you know, with either anemia or well, sickle cell, anemia, malaria, and, you know, the big challenge was always sort of getting a, a, a line into them. Um, and I think, you know, there was always this slight tendency to try to want to do or sort of like a, you know, it, it didn't really often work um you know and and i think you know when you're when you're in a western hospital there's much more of a natural sort of chain of escalation so you know there is going to be somebody
you can come along and do you know is it really going to achieve very much um you know and you know i mean i mean i mean you know into osseus you know we used to, i used to i remember once i mean in fairness this was one of the rare occasions it worked using my 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 stethoscope to hammer a a blood giving needle into the shin of a young boy basically to give him the transfusion and and that did work extraordinarily and it saved his life um and you know and that that was the sort of you know that was the sort of you know you, you're dealing with such kind of sick kids and such altered physiology at that point that your sort of notion of a heroic intervention is is just is is almost absurd and nonsensical you know you find yourself with these kids who have, like, you know, this, like, you're trying to do a central line on this kid. I mean, what, what are you, are you, are, you know, I mean, and, and, and I think, I, I don't know, it's, it's a funny thing, really. You're left with these sort of stark options. You know, you're either sort of, you know, I just do, I have a set of very simple, we have a set of very simple interventions, we do those well. If the kids are too sick, then unfortunately we just have to accept that is life. Or you end up doing a sort of intervention that you're not really, no one's really trained to do and no one's really trained to deal with the consequences. I remember on one occasion, one of the doctors there, a, a very, very sick old man came in. I, I, I can't remember if we knew he had cancer or not, but he had cancer. And... Uh, and and I remember he he obviously had his 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 chest was his pleural cavity was filled with something, and I remember going and speaking to the other doctor. I went I left the ward and I said, look, I think he's probably going to die, and I think he may have a pleural effusion or you know some something very bad in that chest. And the other doctor went off um, uh, went off to see and came back twenty minutes later, and I said to him. So, you know, how was that? And he goes, yeah, the patient's died now. I said, all oh, right. And he goes, yeah, I, I put a needle into his chest and I've got about three litres of blood out. And I was like, oh, right, okay, fine. Do, do, do you think you should maybe not have put the needle into his chest then? And he goes, well, he, he needed it drained. I was like, well, um, hmm. yeah. So I, I was always of the attitude that, you know, a lot of these people, sadly, a lot of these patients are going to die. I just rather not be holding a needle whilst they do die in, in their chest, you know. And and it, it's a funny sort of a level of fatalism there. You know, you, you are basically saying, you know, it, it, you know, you are aware that there's an intervention you could do in a theoretical world in a Western hospital that might gain you some time or might save a life, but you're like, it's not an option here. It's not an option. You know, it's a theoretical option. It's not a real option. I would rather just, you know, except here that we focus on the bread and butter and we do that really, really well and, and leave heroic medicine because it, it's, this isn't the place for it, I'm afraid. I think we could probably fill a whole other podcast on on towing that line um, uh, and that balance when, when working in places like South Sudan. And I think in some places you're... Mm. It's a term I've only come across recently, really. Um, it's kind of clinical courage. So actually, at times when you know situation necessitates being able to work and being comfortable working, you know, slightly beyond your your comfort zone. Um, now, obviously, there's there's a barrier to that, but but like you say, you know, not doing intraosseous access regularly, you know, in, in a UK career, but being trained and comfortable doing it. Uh, in somewhere like South Sudan, when the need arises, you know, quite successfully by the sounds of it, I think very mm. much falls under that that kind of umbrella of, of clinical courage, of, of knowing your skill set, kind of how far you can push it. Um, but then, you know, sounds, you know, very, you know, very reassuring and, uh, and measured to, to hear, you know, very sensible thoughts around actually what what isn't safe or, or, or reasonable to do. And mm. um, I think all of us, you know, all those listening who've, who've worked in, in resource poor environments will will recognise that that judgment. Yeah, yeah. I I think it's um, it was it's always very difficult to know how to message that when you're on the ground. I mean, you you know, there are times when they they you know you, there are times when they want you to do possibly a more heroic intervention, and you're not 
you know, but you also, you know, you also have to explain to them, you have to look after yourself. You know, there's a very big difference in my view between, you know, a, a, an iatrogenic death is, 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 is something very different to a severe malaria or a natural cause death in these contexts. I mean, you know, these, these are communities as well where misconceptions and um, rumors spread very quickly. You know, if you are the white doctor who, you know, there are a string of children who've died with you holding a needle whilst they've died, you know, you, it gets a little bit complicated then, a little bit, your safety and security may not be quite as as guaranteed as you think if you're consistently um, at the scene of, you know, a, a, of some of these children dying. So you have to be very careful to look after yourself, to look after the hospital, you know, and it's, you know, it's, it's not sort of, um, it's not a moral cop-out at times to say, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to jeopardize my own safety here by, by doing something which really, in a Western hospital, I wouldn't really be totally comfortable doing or trained to do, even if, you know, it might theoretically buy a slight increase in chance of survival for the, for the patient. Uh, some really difficult topics to, to think about here and uh, really mm. fascinating to hear, hear your take on that. I, I think very, very few of us will have, you know, to those things day to day come come into our, our calculation of, of what we do of actually, like you say, if things are mis misrepresented, you know, actually what what's the wider um, knock on effect in a, in a, in a community. Um, yeah, really, really fascinating to to hear you know those experiences we've touched on i think lots of challenges um and it sounds like obviously some of those were very difficult some of those i'm sure looking back they were things that, that you look back on sort of fondly what were your kind of what were the high points the the most enjoyable bits the the memorable moments um when you look back was was there anything sort of happy joyful uh times uh, over those 10 months yeah, I mean, I, I, I ran a teaching program for the new members of staff. They were called the trainees on job. And they were all sort of a, a similar kind of age, early 20s. They'd all lost many years of schooling because of the Civil War. And, the, uh, and they were all coming to the hospital basically to earn $25 a month to do basic ward care with, with in their minds – you know, a sometimes not realistic ambition to go to become, go to nursing school, things like that. But anyway, so I, I was responsible for running, you know, a basic training program for them in healthcare, science, you know, and it was quite a broad remit I gave myself. Um, and I mean, they were, they were a wonderful bunch of, of young people. They were so positive and, and they were coming to learning after many years of, 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 of missing out on learning because of of the civil war and you know the bond you established of the bond i established with them i mean you know i still i can still probably name you know or pretty much all of them you know i can remember so clearly the interactions and the emotional content of the relationship with them and you know and the fact that you know you you, you felt like they were symbolic of a country that you know, might at times be having, there may be some hope for its future despite the past, but you also felt their setbacks, you know, you know, and, and, and the frustrations that they, they felt at that, the fact that they couldn't progress, you know, say in the hospital, they were, you know, treated quite poorly at times by the administrators and, you know, they, they, their, their, their belief that they may be able to go to nursing school sometimes wasn't very realistic. Um, but I mean, uh, overall, the, you know, that was, it was a wonderful aspect of the, of the 10 months was training these staff. I used to do staff wide training as well, you know, and, you know, and, and, and they are very used to hierarchy. They are very used to people telling them off, very used to, to aid workers, to Christian missionaries, lecturing them, telling them off, patronizing them, teaching them in this heavy handed way. And it was not something that I was ever going to do. And, and, you know, and I mean, I don't know what you how you describe the relationship. It was just a very sort of warm one-to-one, -one, non, you know, flat hierarchy. 
but at the same time based on deep sort of mutual respect on both sides so um and 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 it, and it and it you know you felt at times that you know in that environment you could really create a very positive spirit and um and of course the frustration then of course was when they were treated heavy in a heavy-handed manner by the administrators you know you felt guilty and you know you felt like the old sort of vestiges of empire were sort of snapping at these poor people's heels all the time that sounds like a, a very rewarding aspect to uh, to a, a 10 months that sounds pretty pretty challenging at, at times that sounds mm. brilliant and and you know ha having known some of the other teaching work you've done i can i can see why you'd have enjoyed that that so much um now uh, there'll be lots of people listening who will be looking sort of ahead in their careers to, to doing perhaps something like this. Um, I mean, I, I know I, for one, you know, chatting here with you, you know, makes me realize, you know, all the, all the, the roles that are out there and the things I'd love to do if, you know, further on in my career. Um, what would your advice be to someone looking to do something similar and maybe not perhaps this exact role, but, but something like this, any, tips tips or hints or um yeah, any advice for, for those people who might want to try and build mm. such a sort of a huge experience into their um into their life yeah i think i mean i, I think i think you know you, you you just have to take the plunge on these things i think you know i too many people unfortunately feel it, too many people i think have that sort of I suppose that concern as to what impact it has on your career, on your CV, you know, I think they still, I think they still approach, too many people are approaching medical career as a, as a CV building exercise. I mean, you've got to be prepared to go to a place like that, knowing that in some ways it's damaging your career, your conventional career. And if you're not happy with your conventional career being impacted and potentially damaged, then you shouldn't go. If you're more prepared to, to be brave and bold and follow a kind of slightly off-piste route, then you just have to do that. You have to do that, ne not necessarily without, I suppose, without fear of the consequences, you know. I mean, you know, a lot of people don't want to step away from training. A lot of people don't want to take time off and not earn very much money and potentially fall behind on portfolio. And if those things are really sort of, concerns to you then i wouldn't do this but i i think you just have to really sort of be bold and take the plunge you know it, it is a life-changing experience it has a kind of impact on you that you know will live with you for the rest of your life um and of course i i, I don't advocate it for anyone i don't I, I definitely don't advocate it for anyone i always very much say if, if it's for you do it if it's instinctively what you think you want to do do it but you know i it, 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 to me i don't sort of morally say you should do it or shouldn't do it it's just it's a question of whether it's right for you um, but don't and don't underestimate how difficult it is don't underestimate the impact it will have on you on your life um so you know i mean the intensity of that experience maybe is is more than a lot of people probably would want but um, but I still I still think there is a bit of you. If you have that vocation, that calling, that desire to go to a difficult place and put yourself in a very difficult situation, I think it's something you should always explore. But you know, it has to be a genuine desire. But then, I mean, I don't know how you know that if it's a genuine desire until you've been there. It's very difficult to assess that. Yeah, I think these decisions and and, and where to take your career and where to spend time are, are always going to be very personal and challenging aren't they and i think it's been really mm. interesting and useful um today to hear the real low points and challenges and i think often with such uh experiences and times in people's lives we often hear the the high points you see the the collection of five or six photos taken over months that sum up you know, the perfect sunset mm. and um you, you know you hear the the real winds and actually being really honest about where things have been super hard and difficult and um and actually that you know counting down 
to, to the end from five months, you know, really paints a, more of a picture of what those experiences are like and I, I think have been been really valuable. Um, mm. Now, looking ahead, uh, you know, do you want to tell us a little bit about what, what you've got coming up next and, and perhaps you know, a little little hint of, of what your two weeks were like in Ukraine with um, with Medics for Ukraine? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going back to Ukraine in a week's time. So I'm going to the east of the country to do a sort of a training role for emergency response teams with a German uh, NGO. Um, so, yeah, a new, a new departure to some extent, a new, uh, a, a new uh, opportunity. So, I mean, I spent, uh, you know, sort of about a week or 10 days uh, in Ukraine recently with, with WEM. So, and, and the medics for Ukraine. Um, and, and it's very interesting. It's interesting to compare the two cultural experiences. That's, you know, being in sub-Saharan Africa and being in Ukraine. Um, I think, I th and I think it sort of dawned on me. It, it, it's a very interesting concept, but, it, you know, it, it's interesting to be in an environment such as Ukraine where there is a lot of needs and a lot of health, there are a lot of healthcare issues, but it's a more familiar culture. It's a more familiar kind of cultural exchange, um, and that is it's not a sort of good or a bad thing. You know, when you I found going to Africa at times, you really feel you're in a very sort of different world, and it's a world that is it's fascinating and exotic and 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 to you at least, um, but it is very sort of alien to you. And it's interesting going to Ukraine. And I think maybe maybe at this point in my life, I appreciated the fact that I was then going to an environment which was more familiar. Um, and whether or not that sort of, you know, I mean, there are sort of, you know, sort of deep visceral connections one feels to moments. And perhaps in this moment, I, you know, more appreciating a, a connection to a culture that's more familiar to my own and less, in, in a sense, from my perspective, less exotic. So I've got two months ahead in um, in, in Ukraine, um, which I'm extremely excited about, and then you really just see how, how it progresses after that. But uh, again, sort of, and, and, and in in a, in a training role, which is really my my passion. Brilliant. I have a sneaking suspicion we may need to get you back on the podcast uh, after your, your your upcoming time in Ukraine to to hear a little bit more about that. Um, and you know, can't wait to hear the the things you do beyond that over the next few years. I've absolutely no doubt they're going to be pretty unusual, pretty exotic, and um, and well worth hearing about. So, been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for your time. Um, nice to to catch up as always, um, and have a great time over over the next few months. Super. Thank you very much, Marcus. Lovely to chat. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please feel free to rate, review and subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to. Please also head over to the World Extreme Medicine website where you can find more engaging content on extreme medicine webinars and indeed the collection of courses from our global network, including humanitarian, disaster relief, expedition, space, military, tactical and performance medicine. Thanks again.